we get inspired by the people that we spend time with. We get inspired sometimes by the stories that we hear. We then are drawn to learn about something because of one or more of those factors. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, here we are again talking about relevancy. Last week we started with the first form of relevancy, which is intrinsic. In, intrinsic, mm-hmm. intrinsic relevancy. And that's where you find what you're interested in and focus on that because that's just a part of who you are. Is that a right? Good? And as teachers and parents, we try to find what children are mm-hmm. intrinsically interested in and give them more opportunity to learn about those things. Great. Okay. But not everything is intrinsically interesting to everyone. All the time. Because even if your child is very interested in styling hair, she might still have to do (laughs) math. Is that right? She might have to. (laughs) So what's the second form of relevancy? So the second form of relevancy, which is, I would say, almost as effective as the first I have termed inspired, Hmm. inspired relevancy. That's where you may or may not be particularly interested in something, but you have a friend who is very interested in that thing. Mm -hmm. And because you love or respect and spend time with that friend, their enthusiasm kind of seeps over. You kind of vicariously gain that interest. So... The relevancy is inspired in you. It comes into you. Right. Yep. I can see that. A couple examples that uh, I use, you know, one hypothetical. Mom says to Billy, hey, Billy, would you like to collect stamps? Billy says, "Um, no, not really. And mom says, okay, well, you don't have to. It's just an idea. Billy goes over to Johnny's house. He comes home. He says, mom, can I collect stamps? (laughs) Mom says, well, I thought you didn't want to collect stamps. He says, well... Yeah, but Johnny's got this awesome stamp collection with stamps from 42 different countries. He's got one stamp that's worth $12. He's got this whole book full, and some of them are really cool. Okay, so what happened? Because he had exposure through his friend, whom he loves or respects to some degree, he now was inspired in a way that he previously wasn't when he lacked information, experience, or inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a hypothetical example. Mm -hmm. I haven't met too many kids who collect stamps anymore, much to the chagrin of the Postal Service, I'm sure. Right. (laughs) I collected stamps. Oh, you did? Yeah. It's because my grandmother had an incredible stamp collection, so she got me going on Mm -hmm. it at an early age. And so I knew all sorts of little obscure trivia about obscure and rare stamps that wouldn't it be incredible to someday find one of those. Probably on a more a more realistic note, I use this example. I came into my kitchen one day in my home in the afternoon, and there were four girls, all of the age of uh, 14 to 17 years old, standing around the island in my kitchen, eating my chips and my guacamole, <laughs> having a heated conversation, an intense conversation about whether admitting Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia into the NATO alliance would alienate Russia and degrade Russian-American relations. (laughs) Now, that's just too weird. Yes. Right? Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Why was it that four teenage girls in their free time, socially, were discussing this extremely obscure subject matter With great knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, they're all on the debate team. Mm. The policy debate resolution for the year was that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, should be significantly reformed or abolished. 
And one of the plans being discussed, the affirmative case, was to admit Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, admit the Baltics, and how how would that work? Would that be a good thing? And what would be better or worse? And how would it affect Russia? How would it affect the U.S.? And because when you go into a debate tournament, you have to know everything there is to know about your case, so you can answer questions and attacks against it. And you have to try to know everything about everybody else's case so you can attack and ask good questions about that. And so they were deep into this, but it wasn't intrinsic. Mm -hmm. Nobody woke up in the morning and said, gee, I think I'd learn to learn everything there is to know about NATO and every obscure possible thing. No, it was that competition that inspired them. It was that positive peer pressure, that was desire to win debate mm-hmm. tournaments. Mm-hmm. And so that can be very effective, this inspired relevancy. So it's not necessarily a person. It could be an activity that inspires them to do something like this. Yeah, I think most of the time it's mm-hmm. a person. Mm-hmm. It's an environment, too. I see. So, yeah. you know, I want to learn all this, you know. And we, I think we have more of these from our childhood than intrinsic ones. Mm-hmm. I know that my father loved sailing and racing sailboats. So from a very young age, I started learning all there was about sailing and racing sailboats. And he got sailing magazines and there was no internet. So what could you do? You'd read whatever was in the house, which in our case was sailing magazines. Mm-hmm. And and so I could have told you all sorts of obscure information like the PHR handicap of different classes of boats and you know the cost of the new boat that was so far beyond our means you can only dream but whoa, how awesome it is mm-hmm. and who you know who who won the transpack you know for the last several years you know all this stuff you know i didn't know a thing about baseball but i knew a lot about sailing right and i don't think that i would have ever in my life woke up one day and said gee i think i just like to learn everything there's to know about sailing but because of the environment and particularly the influence of my father you know that was a i was inspired to learn and know and share that information right so we were talking last time about the book that you had to read lord of the flies lord of the flies and yeah. how to make it more relevant right to boys yeah i found it interesting that that was never on my reading list in light of the fact that we're pretty much the same age Pretty much did high school in the same locale, both mm-hmm. in Southern California, but that was not on my reading list. And I realized later that who I had as an English teacher, she let us pick our own books. Oh. She had a reading list. Uh-huh. I loved Mrs. So it Mark. might have been on the list. You just didn't read it. I am quite sure that if it was on the list, I would not have chosen a book called <laughs> Lord, Lord of, of the, the Flies. Flies. <laughs> I instead chose A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Oh, a- a perfect girl story. <laughs> it was a good book. Yes, it, it was is. hard. It was a hard test, though. But I, um, I enjoyed that, and Mrs. Mark definitely inspired me, and caused me to even more pursue education and even writing. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of us can look back to our childhood and people either that we met as teachers or sometimes as friends of parents or relatives. And their interests had a strong bearing on whether we wanted to follow in that interest Mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. I have a particularly strong antipathy towards biology. (laughs) You too. So I just use it as the brunt of many jokes. Did you have Mr. Andrade as well? I don't remember (laughs) the name of the teacher, but I do remember he was so uninteresting mm. and the stuff was so boring mm-hmm. and there was no application that I could see anywhere in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I went through the motions of studying, take the quiz, try to hold it in your brain long enough, pass the test, get passed, get a grade on the transcript. And then as soon as you can, just let it all go. Right. Because there's, there's, it, there's nothing to make it stick. There's no, any biology... I I do know, I I would say I learned later mm. because there was specific relevancy to what I was interested in. And so, you know, we can also, like you, trace an inspiration to 
a particular teacher or mm-hmm. a particular environment. Last week, I talked about how businesses are attractive to many kids because mm-hmm. they want to have real, honest to God, life and death, meaningful responsibility. And the money that might come and with it. And maybe the money. <laughs> so my favorite class in high school was yearbook. Mm. Because I got to sell yearbook ads. Hmm. And it seemed like this was a real job. Like if if I didn't do it, we weren't going to get the money. And I was in charge. And I had to get everybody out there. And we had to you know, show them why they should buy a yearbook ad. And what were the options. And how to get the money and turn it in. And if, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have a yearbook. Right. I mean, that's probably not true. But I believed it. Right. And so that class, you know, I was very interested in learning how to do that better because it seemed real. I don't think I would have woke up one morning and said, huh, I want to learn how to sell stuff better. I mean, maybe, but it was the environment, the opportunity. I don't remember the teacher or the coach, but I remember that the environment was one that inspired me. So there's a little bit of crossover then perhaps between intrinsic and inspired because we talked last week about entrepreneurship and starting a business as being intrinsically more... To some kids, mm-hmm. yeah. And oh, I see. Okay. There, there's an intrinsic draw to that. Right. In the case of the yearbook, that was there, mm-hmm. and I took the class because I thought it would be an easy grade. <laughs> I took all my classes because I wanted an easy grade, which is probably why I didn't like biology. <laughs> right. <laughs> so... You know, we we get inspired Mm. by the people that we spend time with. We get inspired sometimes by the stories that we hear. We then are drawn to learn about something because of one or more of those factors, and then that becomes easier. Then as adults, it's interesting, our, our method of reinforcement changes. So when we're students, we basically use repetition, right? So, okay, I have to learn this. I'm going to take a test. I have to read it again and again. I got to, you know, make myself a quiz. I got to get my sister to ask me questions, whatever. But as an adult, what's our natural inclination? We learn something interesting. What do we do? Tell someone else about it. We go tell someone. This is one of the huge benefits of being married, (laughs) right, is you got a captive audience, right? Hey, sweetheart, you know what I heard on the radio? It's so interesting. I'm not really telling it to her because I think she's going to be so interested, maybe. But my instinct is, oh, I want to quickly share this with someone to reinforce it so I remember it. Mm -hmm. And and then that's the great thing about being a teacher is you end up being able to share things that interest you again and again in greater depth every time. Right. And you start to know them really well. And that's true whether you're in science or in history or really any field. Mm -hmm. So becoming a teacher, sorry, I'm trying to tie this to relevancy. What you want to be able to do is inspire your students to greater learning, greater understanding. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, one example would be uh, there's a particular group of homeschoolers out there that do a thing every spring in their core program. Mm -hmm called Faces of History. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they study a person from history and they learn everything they can about this person. And then they go and do a little presentation where they dress up and pretend to be this person talking about their life and what they did, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is very motivating to many, if not all of these kids, Mm -hmm. because that is going to be... You know, they're going to be on the stage. They're going to have those minutes where everybody's wanting to learn from them. And so that's an opportunity for them to to teach what they've learned. And that idea of being able to present. You know, you see this even in uh, great books colleges. You see mm-hmm. this in liberal arts college. Uh, you take a Euclidean geometry class, <laughs> right? And And what's the tutor do, the good tutor? He has the students walk through the theorem proof, you know, on the board, teach reteaching it again and again to the other students. Mm-hmm. So they they learn better by teaching each other because there's a higher level of inspired relevance. So how do we apply this then to our teaching, whether we're 
a home teacher or a teacher in a school? Right. Well, thinking about the homeschool world first, because that's you know where I lived and operated with my children mostly, I think it means two things. One is I probably shouldn't teach things that I hate. Hmm. Like Be- biology. Yeah, because if, <laughs> if I were to attempt to teach biology to my children, mm-hmm. I would have to be a very good actor to convince them that there was any value in doing this at all because Mm -hmm. my attitude would trump my desire for them to get it on their transcript or whatever. Mm -hmm. And my attitude that would come through would be, okay, let's just cheer up and pretend we did this (laughs) so we can be done with it and read a good book, (laughs) Right. right? Now, is that the attitude that I want to pass on to them? Probably not. So if... Especially if you have a son or daughter who aspires to be a doctor someday. Sure, (laughs) sure. So, you know, how how do I deal with that? Well, we've never been part of a big, you know, co-op program or a big hybrid school or anything. But I do like to broker deals, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) So on a couple occasions... We've had kind of deals like this. Oh, you're a nurse. Fantastic. That means you probably love biology and chemistry and stuff like that. So tell you what, you take my teenagers for a couple of years, you teach them biology and chemistry one or two days a week, and I'll take your teenagers and we'll do writing and literature and logic, right? And uh, I'll teach what I love and think I'm good at, and you teach what you think you love and you're good at, and then our kids get the best of both worlds. Right. Yep. Right? And and I think schools kind of naturally try to do this as well because they will, you know, have a person teach science who presumably loves science, Mm -hmm. and so they're going to be more excited and innovative about the way they would teach science. It's not not always going to happen. I think that, you know... A school is kind of, it's a harder way to control who your children are taught by. Sure. And as administrator of a school, you want, of course, to find the people who are going to be the most inspiring to your students. Probably not the biology teacher that you had or I had. Probably not, but, you know, who knows what could have been going on in his life. That's right. Yep, you know, true. I'm. I don't want to be judgmental. Mm-hmm. He might have, you know, been sick or had a horrible situation, mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, any number of things can drag a person down. Right. Right. And so, I've learned try to try not to judge and say, "Oh, that's a horrible teacher," sure, because you yeah. just don't know what's going on inside. Sure. But we want to, as mm-hmm. much as possible, cultivate that the people who have a a zeal for learning are there to inspire our students. By the way, the word study, okay, right, which for most children is not a positive word. No. Right? Grown. Yes. But the Latin root means zeal. Interesting. Yeah, hmm. so we study because we have zeal to learn. You mentioned the deals that you broker. Right, that right. That you brokered with your kids. I I did that as well with my boys. In the science area, mm-hmm. and we and my boys all learned science from Mrs. Diaz. Oh, and that little class blossomed into what then became the Biola Star Academics, which is still going on today. But that way, th- those teachers could teach the things that they love to teach, and the students were inspired all over again. So it was great. It was a great opportunity. So. Mm-hmm. So let's talk to our teaching parents, our teaching teachers. How can we inspire them to continue this sometimes arduous task of teaching writing? Oh, teaching writing? Mm-hmm. That's what we do here, right? The Institute for Excellence oh. in Writing. <laughs> we would follow similar principles. One, we would try to find subject matter, source text, yes. things to write about that are, as much as possible, intrinsically interesting to our students. Okay. Uh, we can't always do that, mm-hmm. but we we can often find things that the kids are like, whoa, that's weird. Wow, that's cool. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, that's so interesting. If we can get responses like that, then the kids are going to have 
you know, a better time. I always use the example in uh, the Reach and Reluctant Writer talk of the slime eel. Yes. Also called the hagfish. Yes. This lives in the depths of the ocean, and it has this amazing ability to kind of just exude from its skin, just kind of vomit out from its skin this great blob of slime that then chemically reacts with the seawater and creates an even bigger blob of slime, which then clogs the gills of the attacking, the threatening fish, right? Now, the slime eel, and you can actually watch this on YouTube. The slime eel, in order to get out of its own slime bomb, will tie itself in a knot and then scooch the slime off its tail and get away. Wow. But it gets better because when the slime <laughs> eel eats, it doesn't kind of eat like a normal fish. It it doesn't have teeth in the same way a lot of eels or fish do. It latches on to its prey, usually an older, sicker fish, and it bores a little hole in with this little rasp-like tongue, and then it eats the flesh from the living victim inside out. And that's relevant. <laughs> well, see, a lot of the moms or girls in the audience are like, oh, gross. <laughs> yeah. But all the boys are like, whoa, <laughs> that's so cool. Right. right. So honestly, I mean, if you had to choose between the slime eel and something supposedly important like Dolly Madison and creating the U.S. flag, right? I mean, which one's going to grab the imagination? Right. So that's why we're always saying, you know, start with those source texts that will, that will catch the imagination that are, can be relevant and interesting. And then the boys will have more fun writing about it. Uh, and girls, too. You know, they'll get interested in writing what they want to write about. But they often don't know what they want to. So we choose the source texts. We choose the stories. We try to find things mm -hmm. that are going to have that inspiring relevancy. And so that's kind of on the intrinsic side because hagfish are cool just because they are, right? <laughs> it's not environmental. I didn't inspire a boy to be interested about the hagfish. I just let him know it exists, right? <laughs> right. But uh, on the other hand, uh, teachers, and this is another thing that we suggest often, and that is write the assignments you give to the students. Yes. So you give them, okay, you rewrite this story, retell this story, write this report. Well, you do that same assignment yourself. Let them see you doing it, right, as a teacher. And they'll say, oh, well, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm writing a story. What are your, what's your story about? Oh, I might, I might tell you if you're good, right? <laughs> you know, and they're going to be very curious because yes. then it's like you're with them. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're in there. You're, you're wrestling with it yourself. You're learning better how to teach better. Mm -hmm. They're seeing your example. So you're inspiring it to mm -hmm. some degree. So that would be another application of inspired relevancy. Just being, you know, very available to the student, I think, also inspires them. Yes. You know, I was reading a great little article by my friend Andrew Kern this very morning. Mm. And he said, people who know math love math. People who don't know math think they hate math. But what they really hate is not knowing math. Right. And, and that's true for everything. We don't hate the thing. We hate not knowing it. And so as a teacher, if we can give as much help as is needed to create mm -hmm. a better understanding and a better mastery, right. then the student is going to be liking that more because their understanding is better. Mm -hmm. So having a good understanding of something is critical to having a good experience, which is critical to being motivated to want to learn more about it. Great. Good. That's very helpful. And I know, Andrew, that you inspire many of our listeners to do good and to accomplish great things in this world of education. So thank you for that. Well, that's what we try to do here. Right. You do too. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. 
Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudoua and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Thank you.